here. I'm excited to be here with you guys this morning. And I just have to say, a church this size should not have a worship team that good. Like, and I, here's where I'm coming from with that. I used to preach and travel all across North Texas into smaller, churches smaller, this size and smaller. And I spent a lot of time raising awareness and casting vision, raising financial support for the missions organization I worked with. And I was in a lot of churches about the 150, 200 member range. And I'm telling you, it, let me say it like this. When I was six, we got a cat for Christmas. And we got this cat as a Christmas gift. We raised up was the family cat. That was our family pet growing up. And we had this cat my whole teenage life. And then about 17, 18, I, don't, I, was, I think I was already out of the house. I don't remember. But she developed a, like a growth on her neck. So this cat's getting old. She's like 12 years old at this point. And she had this growth on her neck. And in her final days of life as a cat on the earth, she roamed through the house just making this... I don't even want to replicate the sound because it was this horrible, like, nails on a chalkboard, cat in pain screeching. And she roamed around bumping into walls and vomiting all over the place. And the sound that she made was just this, just this horrible, and a lot of those churches that I was in, that was what their worship team was like. And I'm not saying that to bash any churches. I'm just saying, don't take for granted the worship team that we have here. Because you go to a lot of smaller churches, and that's what you get is the howling, hissing cat. And they kind of act like that, too. Like they're jumping around on stage and bouncing into stuff. And it's just a weird experience. So if you, I've just got to say, we have had an incredible, I mean, it just feels like from glory to glory in our worship team. So if you have served in the worship team for the past six months at all, can you just stand so we can honor you guys? You guys are awesome. You guys are awesome. Thank you, guys. And contrary to popular opinion, you do not need to shave your head and grow a beard to be on the worship team. Um, I mean, every guitar player up here, that's what you get. But maybe that's the anointing in the beard. I don't don't know. Well, anyway, moving on. I'm excited to be bringing this um, continuation of our series that Diane started last week. Didn't she do a great job last week? Wasn't that good? I mean, she... I don't know of a couple more qualified to talk about giving. I, and she, after hearing her tell her story of giving a house away, I'm like, why am I even, what am I going to say? I mean, you gave a house away. Series is over. I mean, let's all just go home and move on. That is crazy. But today is going to be a little different. I do have some stories and some scriptures. And there's a power in a story of what someone, I mean, you heard testimonies this morning. And there's a power in the story of what God has done. So, I'm going to tell you some stories from my life, some things that have happened, some stories of people in this church. And, but, but know this, in Psalm 16, it says, in your presence is fullness of joy. And I love that Pastor Danny talked about that for a moment because sometimes we think, we read that scripture and we read, in your provision is fullness of joy. And the fact of the matter is the joy you'll find in life is found in the presence of God. And I'm thankful for a pastor that has built a church hungry for the presence of God. Is anyone else grateful that that's, what our, that's the basis of this church? That's why our worship team is so incredible, because they're hungry for the presence of God. That's why our sermons are life-transforming, because they're based around the fact that the presence of God changes everything. And so that, I'm going to talk about money, yes, but at the end of the day, it's all about the presence of God. The reality is, though, a lot of us, we go out, we encounter the presence of God, we go out in life and we struggle with money. We have issues. We don't understand some of the principles in God's word. And so we, we are great at encountering the presence of God and not so great at encountering the world system in regards to money because we're not taking the principles that God gave us and applying them to life. Does that make sense? So um, just to recap a few things Diane spoke about last week, the few things that jumped out at me was she talked about first-time obedience and teaching your kids first-time obedience But then a step beyond that, teaching your kids to jump at the opportunity to help somebody and to not just say, yes, I'll obey and do what you tell me to do, but I'm going to look for the opportunity to serve. We can't pick and choose what scriptures we apply to our lives. That was awesome. And then are you looking for excuses or looking for opportunities? And she talked about her kids to set things up. So I'm going to kind of do the same thing. First of all, the title of this is you can take his word for it. Or you can't outgive God. And those are kind of the two themes we're going to weave throughout this message is that when God gives a promise, 
You can take his word for it. And so I have a video. My, I was with um, my daughter this summer. We went on a daddy-daughter date to get some popsicles. And in this moment, she taught me a lesson about how we react when God asks us to give or tithe. So I just want to set this up by showing you this video. Do you like the popsicle I bought you? Can I have a bite? Can I have a bite? Just one bite? She was not very happy. I, I, I was very specific. Do you like the popsicle I bought you? She didn't want to give me any of it. Like, I bought that thing. I bought you this popsicle. Why would you not share just a bite with me? How frustrating. So she's selfish. She's two years old. We're praying for her salvation right now. Um, she's just totally self-absorbed, so we're praying for her. Uh, she's our two-year-old. My wife, Maritza, there in the front. Wave at everybody. And that's our two-year-old, Isabella. And then we've got one more little muffin on the way in January. So growing family. So, yeah, thank you. We're excited. So, but let's get to today. So moving on, four kinds of people are in this room today. And, it, you know, everybody says that. But these are the four kinds of people that are sitting in this room today. Number one, you're new to church. You're maybe a new disciple of Jesus. Maybe you're a visitor today and you're just checking this, this church out. You've been in church your whole life maybe, but you're just visiting Bethel Dallas. Number two, you've been in church. You don't tithe. You, just, you, you struggle with regular giving. You've, you've loved the Lord. You love Jesus. You've done the church thing your whole life, but you don't, um, you don't tithe regularly. You'll give a few bucks here and there, but you don't really. And I'm not trying to make eye contact with any one person. I'm just kind of, you'll notice I'm like bouncing around the room. But you don't tithe, you don't give regularly, you're, just, you're in church, you love the Lord, and you give here and there when you have a few extra bucks. Number three, you've been in church, you tithe regularly, you've got the tithing regular thing down, but you'd never, if ever, give over and above. You're, you're doing the 10%, and that's great, and that's powerful, and that's a good thing to do, but we're, we're struggling to give over and above, and give out of abundance, and give a, have a generous heart in giving. And then number four, you're, you're A-OK. -okay. You have got this thing down. You've got it. You're, you're giving tithes and offerings. You're giving over and above. You, you're, you're doing good. You're, you've got the thing down. You are beautiful. You've got, you give over and above. You do what God is telling you to do in giving. So you're, you're an absolute stellar church member. In fact, you're the one that's going to invite me to, to lunch with you today. That's, that's the fourth kind of person. You're going to take me and my family to lunch today. So those are the four kinds of people here. Primarily in today's message, I'm going to focus on the twos and threes. A little bit the one, because even if you're new to church and a new disciple, you need to understand the concept of tithing and giving. But primarily, I'm talking to people that struggle with regular giving and struggle to ever give over and above. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the context of where we're at today. I'm going to start with Malachi 3. It says, I am the Lord and I do not change. That is why you descendants of Jacob are not already destroyed. Ever since the days of your ancestors, you have scorned my decrees and failed to obey them. Now return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of heaven's armies. But you ask, how can we return when we have never gone away? Should people cheat God? Yet you have cheated me. Or here it says, will a man rob God, yet you are robbing me. But, if you, but you say, how have we robbed you in your tithes and contributions? You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fall to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all the nations will call you blessed for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Got that in there twice there. So having a two-year-old, you get into, some of you guys are looking at the screen going, what? <laughs> having a two-year-old, you get into children's books pretty quickly and you begin to understand the concept of children's books and you start researching what books are age appropriate for my child and all of that. So I recently stumbled across a book called this, Billy Twitters and the Blue Whale Problem. And this whole concept is pretty funny. Is a brand new children's book author. He actually had a TED talk. His name is, is Mac Barnett. I'm gonna show you a clip of it in a second. 
But Mac Barnett talked about, I wanted to write children's book, books, and he said, I wanted to do it in a way that blurred the line between fantasy and reality, or blurred it between imagination and reality. So I tried to make an experience more than just reading a children's book for these kids. And so what he did is he wrote a book called Billy Twitters and His Blue Whale Problem. I have it here because when I saw this, I had to buy it. So the whole concept of this book is Billy Twitters is a boy that lives in San Francisco, and his parents give him a blue whale as a pet, but it's intended as a punishment because at first Billy's excited, but then you realize the responsibility that goes along with raising a blue whale. Where are you going to put a blue whale? Where, how, what do you feed? They eat like tons of krill and shrimp. What are you going to feed this blue whale? Then he has to take this blue whale to school, and they live in San Francisco, and there's all these hills. How are you getting the blue whale to school? So he wrote this fun, creative, imaginative book on giving this kid a blue whale as a punishment. And on the inside flap, when they launched the book, on the inside flap of it, there was a card that said, do you want your very own blue whale? And it was, it was made like a 1950s-style mail order advertisement in the actual book. And so you could tear it out and send in a self-addressed stamped envelope for your very own blue whale. And they set up this whole campaign around this children's book. And kids actually wrote in letters. In fact, one kid wrote in and said, uh, dear people, I bet you 10 bucks you won't send me a blue whale. Like written in crayon. It's so funny. But people started, kids started sending in letters asking for their own blue whale. And they really believed that they were going to get a blue whale. And so they took it a step further. And if you sent in a letter asking for your very own blue whale, you got back another letter from a Norwegian law firm that said, hey, we've received your request. Your whale is on the way. However, we're having trouble. This is, this is actual real life. Like, this is what they really did in real life. This isn't in the book. This is how they launched the book in real life. So you get a, a letter from this Norwegian law firm that says, we're having trouble getting your whale through customs because of a recent change in customs laws. But we want you to know your whale's very safe. He's doing well. There's a wonderful fjord here, way that, here in, the, in Norway that they're taking care of him, and he's fine. Here's a picture. His name is Randolph. It gets better. They send a phone number. Here is your whale's phone number if you would like to call and speak with your whale. So they would dial this phone number with their parents' permission, call in, and get a bunch of whale noises, and then a beep, beep. And kids would call in and leave messages for their whales. So they had set up this whole, and they don't do it anymore because I think they just got so inundated with requests for blue whales, they couldn't even keep up with the demand. But they kept this whole chain going, and these kids really believed that blue whales were coming. I want to show you a clip of this TED Talk where he describes what happens when kids leave these voicemails. Check this out. And they got a picture of their whale, too. So this is Randolph. Um, and, and Randolph belongs to a kid named Nico, who was one of the first kids to ever call in. And, uh, and I'll, I'll play you some of Nico's messages. This is, the first, this is the first message I ever got from Nico. Hello, this is Nico. I'm your owner, Randolph. Hello. So, this is the first time I can ever talk to you, and I might talk to you soon another day. Bye. So, Nico called back like an hour later. <laughs> and here's another, here's another one of Nico's messages. Hello, Randolph. This is Nico. I haven't talked to you for a long time. But I talked to you on uh, Saturday or Sunday, yeah, Saturday or Sunday. So now I'm calling you again to say hello, and I wonder what you're doing right now. And I'm going to probably call you again tomorrow or today. So I'll <laughs> talk to you later. Bye. So he, did, he called back that day again. Uh... And he's left over 25 messages for Randolph over four years. Um, you find out all about him and, and like the grandma that he loves and the grandma that he likes a little bit less. <laughs> and the crossword puzzles that he does. And, and, and this, is, this is, I'll play you one more message from Nico. This is, 
Uh, this is the Christmas message from Nico. Hello, Randall. Sorry I haven't talked to you in a long time. It's just that I've been so busy because school started, as you might not know, probably since you're way old, you don't know. And I'm calling you to just say, um, to wish you a Merry Christmas. So, um, have a nice Christmas, and bye-bye, Randall, bye-bye. I actually got, I, Nico, I hadn't heard from in uh, 18 months, and he just left a message two days ago. Uh, his voice is completely different, uh, but he put his babysitter on the phone, and uh, she was very nice to Randolph as well. Um, but Nico's the best reader I could hope for. Isn't that cool? So Billy Twitter's in the Blue Whale Problem. Kids actually believed their whale is coming, and they held on to that with such tenacity and aggression and, and calling like 25 times for the blue whale. And this scripture is our guarantee in the front flap that our blue whale is coming. And I think a lot of times we struggle to tithe, give regularly and give over and above because we don't realize that there really is a blue whale coming, that there really is promises. What if God means it when he says, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. Your crops will be abundant for I will guard them from insects and disease. Your grapes will not fall from the vine before they are ripe. And then all the nations will call you blessed. What if... What if we can take God's word for it? What if there really is blessing on the end of the promise? If Nico can believe the publishers of this children's book for a blue whale, how much more can we believe God when he makes a promise, he's going to keep it? And there's a lot of us that clock out of this because we say, well, that's Old Testament and tithing's not relevant for today. I'm not, I don't even have time to get into all that. I'm going to point you to some resources that prove otherwise um, towards the end of this, but Jesus had plenty of opportunities. He was confronting Pharisees about tithes, and he had plenty of opportunities to refute the tithe and say that it's not relevant, and he didn't. He said, actually, he reinforced what they were doing as a good thing. And so that's the short version of the tithe is relevant. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you four quick points and four quick stories along with each of those. Some of those are stories that have happened to my wife and I. Some of them are stories that, uh, one of them is a story that happened to somebody in our church, and you're going to love it. It's, it's pretty powerful. So open your Bible or turn to the screen to the book of Luke. Luke 9. I didn't do that on purpose. So point number one, Start small. God is more concerned with your availability than the amounts. And I loved how Diane brought that home last week because she talked about her mom going to the dollar store and getting things to give to people, even though she, she maybe didn't have a house to give away like she did, but she could do something small. And God is more concerned with are you willing and able and, and ready to do something He's more concerned with that than the amount. So let's look in Luke 9, 10 through 17. On their return, the apostles told him all that they had done. This is a very common story. You all know this. And he took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. When the crowds learned it, they followed him, and he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. Now the day began to wear away, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away to go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get provisions, for we are here in a desolate place. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. They said, We have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we are to go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. I love that. Like, I mean, we can go buy some food if you want. I don't really, like, were they really expecting to be able to buy that food? It's kind of a weird question. Have them sit down in groups of about 50 each, and they did so and had them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And they, they all ate and were satisfied. And what was left over was picked up 12 baskets of broken pieces. So five, let's just do the math. 5,000 men broken up into groups of about 50 each, and they took five loaves and two fish. This, 
a story, I, I put it in a part of my brain that's like Bible fiction. You ever do that? You read a story and you're like, that's great, but I don't really see that happening today. So you kind of categorize it. Okay, it really happened, but it's, it, you know, it was a cute story. I'm just being honest. We kind of categorize it until six years ago, I saw a real life loaf and fishes story happen. And it's the whole concept of taking something small and watching God multiply it. My wife and I were not married yet. We were, this was six years ago in September. We were having one of those conversations before you get married that you have that says, we need to talk. You know what I'm saying? Some of you guys aren't, yeah, Janae's looking over at Zach like, yeah, this is the conversation. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to call you guys out. But we're having one of those conversations like, hey, let's, let's talk about where this is going. And we're eating at the fine dining establishment Olive Garden. And we are, hey, when you're young and just graduated college, that's a fine dining establishment. So we were dining at Olive Garden eating, and our server came up to give us the card, and we said, I don't remember which of us said this, but we said, hey, if there's anything we can pray for you about, um, we just have it on our heart to pray for you. Is there anything we can pray with you about? And she goes, okay. So she took our card and left, and a different server came back and brought the card back. Like, wait, what? Did we really offend her that bad? So we paid the tab and got up and went, to, hey, can you bring our server back? Like, we wanted to talk to her. And she came back, and turns out it was just a little bit of a language barrier with her English. And so Marita talked to her in Spanish, got to the bottom of it, figured out there was actually a lot going on that we could pray for. She had recently lost her mother. She recently had her third baby. Recently found out, all within like the past year, found out that she um, had cancer, and her husband had just left her. Yeah, what you're feeling right now is what we felt in that moment six years ago was, what? Maritza was really, really burdened. And she was just like this. I mean, we both were. And we sat there, went off in the corner and prayed. But it was like, that prayer, I mean, that's like this. What do we, all that going on, like that's, that's too much. That's crazy. So Maritza, um, I wanted to give her the mic and have her tell this, but she refused. So I'm going to read. I had, her, I, I had her write it down when it first happened, so I'm going to read what she wrote. I felt so small and helpless when all I wanted to do was provide for her. A few weeks later, as I was praying one morning, the Lord laid a burden on my heart for her. I began to weep and weep and weep so heavily for her. It was as though I could feel her pain, her fears, her heart, heartache. I decided that although I couldn't do all that I would like to, I could give her what I could afford. So we went to Walmart together, got a Walmart gift card for 50 bucks, and put it in a nice card. That's her thing. Put it in a nice card. I'm like, I don't care about the card. Just give me the gift card. But she put it in a nice card, packaged it real pretty, wrote a note. We're praying for you. We love you. Let me know if there's more we can do. And that was kind of the end of it. This was in October by this point. And we, um, we heard about the KLTY 94.9 Christmas Wish. Anybody heard of that? So Maritza, with like three days to spare, come on, if it's not for the last minute, you wouldn't get anything done, right? Some of you guys you know what I'm talking about, but with like three days to spare, she wrote up her whole story that had happened to us and why she was deserving of this Christmas wish and sent it in. And what they do is they read the stories and then match them. There's groups all over the Metroplex that said, we want to help with the Christmas wish. So we want to, they match the stories of people with groups that say they want to help. And we got a call. This was like time's passing. So we're like, wow, we're still really burdened and we're still praying for her. And we're still thinking like, man, there's got to be something we can do. But, you know, so we had kind of let, let the Christmas wish thing slip out of our minds. And we got a call from KLTY, Maritza did, that, hey, we found a match for the Christmas wish for your, for your girl. Wow, that's awesome. So they said, the group is going to be here. They said it's a group out of a church in Dallas that they want to come together and bless her. And so they're going to be here at this Chick-fil-A at such and such a time. Can you be here as well? She said, okay, sure. So we met at the Chick-fil-A and got to meet the group and meet the people. We knew something big was going to happen, but we didn't really know quite what. So we're all there, and they do this on the air. Have you heard this? So they're in Chick-fil-A with the person that's being blessed and with the people that are doing the blessing. And they're there on the air, and they say, man, we just were blessed by your story. We appreciate a young couple reaching out like this, and we're going we're gonna to partner. We've just started meeting as a small group in our church, and we have it on our heart to bless someone. And so this feels like it's right up our alley. So we said, wow, okay, um, awesome. 
So they said, here's what we're going to do. And I wrote it down because it's like, <laughs> I did not, I did not want to mess it up because it's so much. So they said on the air, this is the first time we're hearing this. Remember, it started with a prayer and a $50 Walmart gift card. We're going to pay six months of rent for her. We're buying all her boys' Christmas gifts. In fact, they're in our truck right now, out back. We bought you a new TV. It's also in the truck. Um, new furniture for your apartment. And for the next six months, you're going to receive a $100 Kroger gift card and a $100 Target gift card. And we're like, she starts crying. We start crying. Oh, my goodness. This is bananas. What is happening right now? Like, we felt like the 12 basket thing. Like, this, is, this just multiplied beyond what we could ever have imagined. This is crazy. I can't believe this. And then they turn to us and they go, and Luke and Maritza, we want to give you guys 500 bucks. I'm like, what? what? Like, okay. But a hundred of it is Olive Garden gift cards. I'm like, okay. All right. There's the kicker. So um, I can't stand Olive Garden, but it was, pretty, it was pretty good. It was pretty powerful. The crazy thing is they did the same thing for her next year. Isn't that bonkers? That's just like, that's the real life loaves and fishes. And God can still multiply something small if you'll just be obedient. Number two, God wants to use you as a vehicle of blessing in someone else's life. Sometimes we imagine that God's blessing looks like thousands of dollars in bills in a suitcase that he randomly puts on someone's front door. And not the fact that maybe you are supposed to be the blessing in someone else's life. My story for this one this is, um, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but this is a scripture you can reference later, 1 Kings 17, 8 through 15, of Elijah being fed, or Elijah, I'm sorry, being fed by ravens by the creek. And he says, I want you to go to this town. The ravens stopped bringing the food. He said, go to this town and ask this woman. And this woman had one last piece of bread, enough to make one last piece of bread for her and her son. We're going to eat this bread and die. It's like really encouraging, <laughs> powerful thought. And he says, well, can I have it? And okay. And so she feeds him. She blesses him with what she has and sees multiplication in her life because the food doesn't stop coming and the food is there. So go look that up later. Read that later just for time's sake. I'm going to blaze through it right now. And this is, this is the real life version of what happened to me in that situation. So fast forward a year from the Christmas wish thing. It was October the church we were a part of was doing a series on giving, and my wife and I were married at this point, and we were very, so that we need to talk conversation worked out pretty well. Um, we, we were married at this point. We're going through a series on giving in our church, and we were faithful tithers growing up. We gave 10% of everything, but we struggled. I'm, I was the number three in the points there, that we struggled to give over and above, and we never had thought about being crazy generous or doing crazy things. And so we were really convicted in that area through this message. And I was working for a full-time job that I didn't like, and I was waiting tables on the side. I had some credit card debt I was trying to pay down, and um, I was trying to get ahead for the Christmas season. The whole time I'm working on this whole concept of generous giving, and I'm frustrated. And so one Friday night before work, I'm reading my Bible in the break room, and I'm getting ready to go out and wait tables. And i reading, and I'm praying, and I'm like, God, I don't even want to read this right now. I'm kind of frustrated because I feel like I'm a newlywed, and I'm not really spending time with my wife because I'm working so hard to provide and pay down my debt and all this. And so I'm just like having this real, like, God, I don't really want to talk right now, but can we talk kind of conversation? And so he's, he's quiet, so I'm, but I just pray that out of my frustration. I say, I want to be able to spend some time with my wife and be romantic with her but I don't have the money to do it because I'm trying to also be obedient in being prepared to be a generous giver. So that was it. I shut my Bible, put it in my locker, and went to go wait tables. It's a Friday night. It's crazy busy. People are running around. It's just a, a typical Friday night in a fancy restaurant. And one of the bartenders comes up to me and says, hey, Luke, there's a guy named Gavin. I knew Gavin. He was a, um, a regular. I talked to him frequently. He knew my life. He knew I was a newlywed. He knew I was in the ministry previously and so we had a good con good conversations a lot he's she said um, hey Luke Gavin's here he wants to talk to you can you can you go see him so, oh, so I'm crazy busy right now I'm sweating I, I'll go talk to him in a second well three hours go by and I completely forgot to go talk to Gavin and I went up to the bar when I remembered I said oh Laura I said is where's Gavin I, I, he and she's like he's long gone oh, man but he did leave something for you so okay cool so she hands me a crumpled up napkin and I take it 
and open it and see there's money. And I'm like, does she know there's money in here? Was this really for me? So I put it in my pocket and go back to the break room and open it up. And in it, on a crumpled up napkin, is a note that says, Luke, do something nice for your wife. You're such a blessing. God bless. Here's 100 bucks. And that was a $100 bill wrapped up in there. And there was this moment of this such specific need met because I had just that day prayed out of frustration that this need was not being taken care of in the way that I wanted it to. And God used this guy to meet that exact specific need. And that turned me on to the fact that God uses people to be vehicles of blessing and provision. God doesn't send briefcases full of money, at least he hasn't to me yet. But he uses people to slip notes and $100 bills to answer powerful, frustrated prayers. Isn't that good? So first time obedience matters. Number three, the power of decision. And I've, I've never heard of this happening. This happened to me once. We had, in this season where everything was going on, we decided to give a missionary friend of ours $100. In the season of learning about generosity and paying down debt and all of that. So we sow a $100 seed and we decide to give it. We, we hadn't even given it yet, but we decide to. And a few days later, we're giving it that Friday, and on Thursday, a check shows up in the mail from somebody I hadn't talked to in years that was $200. Yeah, and what was weird to me is we hadn't actually given anything yet. We just decided to. And so, is that supposed to happen? And then I talked to somebody in our church that had a similar experience, and I had them make a video to show what happened, but the fact that once they decided to obey God in the giving... Something happened, so check this out. There you go, bro. Your car. If you're gonna give a gift, you gotta give it away right. So, we're gonna make sure that this thing is looking nice. Now every time I drive the car, I feel like I'm not even uh, driving my own car. I feel like I'm just borrowing Desmond's car and driving it, so I want to take care of it. So let's get this thing functioning and working right. Now that we got this all cleaned out like new, we're going to put some brand new mats in for them. If you're going to give something away, you got to give it away right. step is to get him a full tank of gas. Now the plan is to pick up Desmond right after church and have him come help us move for a couple hours and then somehow figure out a way to get him a check for $2,000 as the first surprise and then transition into a way to giving him a car as the second bigger surprise. Here we go. Thank you guys so much for your help. No problem. Is that good? That's good. Yeah, that's great. Awesome. That's awesome. Did you look you at it? it? I saw it. But that's for something else though. So, what is it for? <laughs> I want you to put that in your bank account. So now you have a bank account, right? Oh, I can do that. All right. The next president is outside. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> Come on out, bro. Just so you know, mm -hmm. a lot of people had to come together to make this happen. A lot of people. There you go, bro. Your car. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> what? Yeah. This is rude. <laughs> so, about a month ago, uh, Lauren and I, uh, we just really felt like God just wanted us to give you one of our cars. Yeah. So, yeah, this is yours. Wow. Congrats, man. Wow. You deserve it. God loves you, bro. <laughs> Man, that was such an exciting experience and truly an unbelievable feeling, but it's not quite the end of the story yet. It took us a month to finally decide to give the car away for a reason. And that's because Lauren's car was completely paid off. And as you saw in the video, she was very pregnant, which means we'd have to get another vehicle and have another car payment, which is something we weren't excited about at all. But literally the day after we decided to give it away, not the day before, not a week before, but the day after we took that step of faith, something really cool happened. Out of the blue, a friend of mine reached out to me and uh, asked me if I'd be willing to do a little bit of work for his company. And in exchange for the work, well, he decided to give us a car. And this is exactly the car that we were looking at getting for Lauren. How awesome. A few things to pick up on there that he did. I'm <laughs> just like, wow, like that's crazy. But a few things that he did was he did it well, he did it right, and he also raised about $2,000 to give him in addition to the car to help cover insurance and gas. Like crazy. And then they're given, not when they gave the car away, when they decided to give the car away, they were given a better vehicle. And it was probably about four or five times the cost of the work that he was asked to do for the value of the car. Does that make sense? So the value of the car was probably about five times the actual value of the work he was performing. So it's just like crazy. It's absolutely nuts. Um, but I've never heard of that happening, and then I hear it start happening. So there's power in just deciding to obey God when he asks you to do something. And finally, I'm going to close with this. You really can take his word for it. There really is a blue whale coming. You can call and leave voicemails. You can call and talk. There really is blessings on the other side of God's promise. You can take God's word for it. And my really quick story about that was the timing of all of this is interesting because we were in a series in this time of year about giving and generosity, and we started thinking about it, and God laid on our hearts. This was after the, um, after the Gavin thing with the crumpled up $100. God laid on our hearts to give big time, like that kind of stuff. And so um, we decided to sow what some people call a first fruit offering into our church. So this was October, and we said, okay, in January, we want to sow a biggest, the biggest, best gift we've ever given. We want to do it in January. And um, I'm, not, I'm not telling you these stories to, to tell you, look how amazing we are. I'm just telling you to tell you, if you obey God, crazy stuff happens. And I'm hoping you're hearing the victory that has happened in what comes from obeying God. When David slayed Goliath, an entire army went from quaking in their knees to becoming confident, victorious, overcoming warriors. And so that's the point of these stories is to say there's victory on the other side of this. I want to empower you to be generous, tithing people because there's victory and blessing on the other side. So where was I? Um, first fruits offering, thank you. So we were going through and doing our first fruit offering, and we decided to give my first paycheck from my full-time job and Maritza's first paycheck from her full-time job combined together, give both of those away for a first fruits offering. And we're like, it's October, and we're looking at it like, this is, like, you know Christmas is coming up, right? Like, this is pretty crazy. So talk to your spouse 
about what God is asking you to do. Ask the Holy Spirit, God, what do you want me to do to become an over and above giver? And confer and have a family meeting with your spouse and decide this is what we're going to do. So that's what we did. And we started budgeting for it. We plan, we, we plan as a society for Christmas, and we plan for big events and vacations, but do we budget and plan for over and above crazy giving? Do we take time and money and energy and set it aside with the intent to say, I'm going to be a generous, enormous, blow-your-mind kind of giver? When God speaks, obey and, and follow through on that. So that's what we were doing, and we're setting money aside, and we're preparing for the fact that our first paychecks in January were not going to be ours, that we're going to give them away. So January, uh, no, I'm sorry, December 31st, we were looking for a church in the area that was having a New Year's Eve prayer and prophecy service. And we're like, kind of like, okay, here, it's coming. We're going to give away, we're going to give away our first paychecks. Hadn't happened yet. I think mine was due on January 6th, and hers was going to hit the bank on January the 8th. So we're prepared to do that, but we're New Year's Eve service. We're wanting to celebrate the new year with prayer and prophecy. And there was a lot of churches that were doing like a half hour or an hour prayer, but there wasn't a lot of churches that were doing like seven to midnight prayer ringing the new year. But there was a church called Bethel Dallas that I saw on Facebook having a prayer and prophecy New Year's Eve service. So we decided to go. And I got a, we got there a little bit late and we were excited. I had, I had stayed loosely connected to Pastor Danny. We had met at a previous church, and so I had been loosely connected on Facebook, and that's how I saw the ad for the church. We go to the church, and we're there, and it's powerful. They're doing visions and, and uh, like, writing out the visions for the year and prophesying over people and all this. And somebody, um, I'm going to come back to this here. So this is the trying to outgive God story, but somebody stands up and prophesies over me and says, you in the back with the red polo. And I stand up and she, she gives, I'm not going to tell you who it is, but she gives me this prophetic word that is just absolutely wrong. <laughs> like, I don't want to say wrong, like sinful wrong, but wrong, like that does not even make sense to me. Like, it, it, this is my face. <laughs> like... Okay, so she's prophesying over me, and she's declaring these things over me, and, and she's just into it, man. And I'm like, and she goes, does that resonate with you? And I said, uh-huh. That, that face right there, exactly. And she says, okay, praise God. And I sit down, and, and um, she goes, okay, she starts to move on with the service. Pastor Danny gets up and says, wait a second, God's not done yet. And he grabs the mic and starts, do you remember this? Starts prophesying over me. And it is like, boom, like as wrong and weird as the first prophecy was, this one was like dead on the money. And I sat down and my wife was like, wow. Like we're just like, I didn't have a good face to show you for what happened after the good prophecy, but it was not that face. So we go and we're, we're going through the service, and we're just, it's a powerful time. It's completely rocked our world. And I get a phone call from a number I didn't recognize on January the 4th. I was at work, and I was frustrated in my job, but I had, didn't have anything else to pay the bills. And Pastor Danny was on the other line. He says, hey, and some of you may know this, but he runs a business. He doesn't get paid by the church. And so he called me. He says, hey, we just had a, a girl that was working for us leave, and she did our graphic design and media stuff, and we're looking to hire somebody to help me in our business with media and graphic design. Would you be interested in that? And I'm like trying to be real chill, like, uh-huh. I mean, we could talk about it, yeah. But on the inside, I'm like, yes! Are you kidding me? It, you know, knowing how amazing of a man Pastor Danny is and coupled with the frustration of the job I was currently in, I was like fist pumping, but I'm like, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, okay. Um, sure, we can make an interview work. So we meet at his house. He interviews me and my wife together and says, this was on a Thursday, and he says, we'll call you on Sunday at the latest with a decision if we're going to hire you or not. I said, okay. So this was this, Janu this Sunday. The dates may be fuzzy, but the Sunday was the day that, w that following week would have been when we're giving our paychecks. So I think it was that Monday and Wednesday when those paychecks were set to hit our accounts, and then subsequently leave for the first fruits offering. And so he calls me on 
Sunday at like 7.30. And I'm like, man, you weren't kidding when you said Sunday at the latest. <laughs> okay, okay, um, Maritza, Maritza, turn the TV down, turn the TV down, hold on. <clears throat> Hello? <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. So we talk, and he offers me the job and tells me the, the wage. And it was, a, it was a jump in income, and, and I was blessed, and I was like, wow, this is great. Like, yes, absolutely. I was more excited about the opportunity to work for such an amazing couple than I was excited about, I mean, I was excited about the money. I'm not going to lie, but I was more excited to work with these people, so really they could have paid me a Snickers bar and a donut, and I would have worked, you know? So <laughs> you didn't hear Cut that from the recording. But <laughs> I was excited, and then we sat down on the couch after the phone call and just kind of looked at each other like, is this really happening right now? Remember, we're, 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 trying, we're trying to test God, and we're trying to outgive God. And we're saying, I wonder if God really means it when he says, test me in this and see if we do not pour out blessings. And then we get this phone call and realize that stuff's starting to happen. Blessings are starting to happen. And we did, I did some math about 30 minutes later in my head, and I realized that the amount in our monthly income that had increased was the exact amount to the dollar that we were giving away in our first fruits offering. He didn't know that. Isn't that nuts? So it's almost like God's saying, okay, okay, you're going to outgive me. It's going to stress you out. You're going to freak out. You're going to budget and save for it and plan for it. And you're going to go crazy trying to come up with the money. Watch this. You can't outgive me. Test me in this and see what happens. Test me in this and see if you cannot outgive me. So I apologize for going, well, there's that again. Apologize for going a little bit over the time, but I'm going to leave you with a few practical resources that will help you and some homework. So these are some resources. The Blessed Life book is a great resource to help you understand the theology of giving and tithing and uh, giving over and above. Uh, Dave Ramsey stuff, they actually have a sale right now on their site. I'm not getting paid to say that. I'm just letting you know that they have a lot of great resources that are on sale right now um, that will help you steward your money so you can be an over and above giver. And, and, and as well, Danny Johnson has a great series on the war on debt, great program. And then our Bethel Dallas community group. That's a great resource to be a part of. You plug into the Facebook group. It will help you um, understand who, what's going on in our church and what's happening to people and what God is doing through people's lives in our church. So here's your homework. Begin regular tithing if you're not already. Pray about regular over and above giving. So maybe God is calling you to give a different number than 10% to the church. A bigger number, <laughs> not a smaller number. Pray about significant stretching gifts. Powwow with your spouse on that. And whoever has the bigger stretching gift number in their mind, they're the one that heard from God. <laughs> That's for real happened. Or we'll pray and say, God's, God's calling me to give this money. Okay, what number did you get? I got 100. I got, I got 50. I got 100. Yeah, God told me 100 too. So pray, powwow with your spouse, and then do random small stuff. Crumple up $100 bills and napkins and give it to people. You never know what God is going to do through that and how that's going to impact somebody's life. Is that good? Is that good? So let me just leave you with the last, um, the four points to sum it up. Start where you can. God wants to use you as a vehicle for blessing someone else. God honors first-time obedience. There's power in the decision. And you can take God's word for it. You're not going to outgive him. There's a blue whale coming. Test him in it and see. Test him and see what happens. Thank you, guys. We, we don't normally pass the offering plates um, in this church. We're going to do that today. I'm not giving an altar call or anything because this needs to be more an internal thing. You need to go home and think about this. You need to go home and process this with your spouse. You need to go home and ask the Holy Spirit what he's calling you to do in the area of giving. So I'm not going to ask you to make those decisions this second and create an emotional environment for you to do that. I'm going to ask you to process it, connect with your spouse, connect with the Holy Spirit, and see what God wants you to do. Amen? So we're going to do our offering declarations together, and we're going we're gonna to talk about a few more things. But thank you guys for your time today. Great job, Luke. Thank you, Luke. And as our, our ushers are going to.